Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. As the, the mutton bird cries out, as the parrot cries out, uh, so do, uh, so too do I. Uh, behold, there is life uh, to the land, um, the standing place of the nation. Uh, greetings uh, to the indigenous people, um, to all of you esteemed ones. Uh, great are the, the greetings to you. Um, so greetings, greetings from us in Aotearoa and the, and the Pacific. Got it, Simon. Thank you for that. Um, so as Kate mentioned, the, the purpose of today's uh, event is to launch our special edition with the Journal of Sociology. Uh, that was a rapid response commentary we did in response to COVID-19, the global pandemic. Um, it will be out in hard copy in December, uh, but almost all of those articles are already available online first, should you be interested, and we hope that you are. Um, in saying this, we'd like to send out a special thank you to Sage, the journal's publishers, who've been a great source of support to us over the years as an association. Uh, and I would like to thank our association, TASA, the Australian Sociological Association, for all the great support they've given Kate and myself over the four years of our editorship of the journal. Um, it, we do feel that today's event is a great fit with Australian Social Sciences Week. And part of our motivation, of course, was to assert the central significance of social science for understanding the issues uh, that, that COVID-19 presents. So I'll now hand over to Kate to introduce uh, all of the panelists. Okay, we have uh, four wonderful, I'm sorry, five to six wonderful panelists today. Um, we, we hope that Ray Wing Connell will be joining us, but maybe having some technical issues. Uh, but to start with, we have David Rowe, who is Emeritus Professor the Institute of Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. David, David would you mind um, saying hello and, and waving to the audience so they can see you? Thank you. Oh, you're on mute, David. I'm unmuted. Hello, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we have Professor Robert Van, Van Creeken from the University of Sydney and is also Adjunct Professor at the University of Tasmania. Hi, good to be here. And we have Dr. Simon Barber and Seriana Napi from the University of Auckland. Hey. Great to have you here. And Professor Lynn Craig from the University of Melbourne. Hello, everyone. Hi there. And we do have Raywin. Raywin's raised your hand. You can't see Ray Wynn at the moment, though. He's obviously Professor Emerita of the University of Sydney, and hopefully we can hear from her very soon. Okay, Steve. Thank you, Kate. So uh, we will start by asking each of our participants to take five minutes to summarise their paper, uh, and then we'll pose a question to them. Um, we should have plenty of time at the end uh, to open it up to questions from you, the audience, and you can ask questions anytime by the QA function. So please do uh, uh, prepare some questions for the panel. That would be great. Okay. Okay, we'll start with David. David, would you mind sharing with us a, a summary of your, your article? I'll just unmute. Thank you. Okay, thanks for um, uh, the invitation. And uh, quite a, just a, as a, a starter, I think this, the issues that we're discussing today are not only uh, of interest to um, Australian social sciences, but I think I think globally. And interestingly, the virtual paper I wrote has already had uh, an approach from a, a, um, a media organisation based in London. So uh, we we are uh, uh, addressing, I think, uh, truly global issues. My um, my paper is called Subjecting Pandemic Sport to a Sociological Procedure, which is a, 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 a little bit of a joke around health and medicine. But uh, I, I, and that was partly, I, I use that kind of language, partly I think as a sociologist to, um, to kind of protest in my own way about some of the, of the discourse around the pandemic. I mean, we've heard, how many times have we heard, this is a, um, a health, not just a health crisis, but it's an economic crisis. Um, 
that's been said constantly, but hardly anyone has actually said, well, this is actually a social crisis. First and foremost, it's a social crisis because, um, because we all occupy uh, that something called society. And uh, I also think that um, uh, one of the most objectionable, uh, you know, again, common terms um, used was where the social is mentioned, it's mentioned, mentioned in terms of distancing. So social distancing is, is uh, you know, has been constantly talked about when actually people talk about physical distancing, because what we don't want in the middle of a pandemic is actual social distancing, that is, people being socially isolated from each other. So one of the areas that I think is very important, it's been all over the media, public discourse, governments, corporations talking about it a lot, is sport, because uh, sport is one of those areas of mediated culture, uh, which we have got very used to. It's part of the rhythm of everyday life, uh, uh, attending, um, participating, uh, and watching. Mostly, I might say, watching. Um, on television. That's what most people do uh, with sport, uh, a great deal of exaggeration about uh, participation levels. A adult, only about one in five adults, for example, in Australia participates regularly in sport and um, over half, about 60%, actually don't participate in organized sport at all. But most people, over 85%, watch it on television. So we had this whole question, uh, and this is not uh, unusual uh, in the pandemic. I mean, we can think of higher education to some degree, tourism, um, you know, um, the airlines and so on, where we're suddenly a, a kind of switching off of something. And in the case of sport, it was a, the, the switching off of the live, the key live elite sporting event. And, um, and then gradually being brought back in with, um, with audiences uh, of some kind, such as in the form of cardboard cutouts in Stadia. Uh, we won't, you know, we don't have to mention, but I will, um, the, you know, the re one of the first cases of introducing uh, an artificial audience to sports encounter was in FC Seoul, um, which introduced um, sex dolls uh, into the stands and uh, were, were um, uh, fined and, uh, and much criticized for that. But a whole game then uh, has appeared about trying to reconstruct uh, the um, sport. And uh, in, in, at a time where uh, the supply has been cut off. And my, my um, paper is about, well, what, what does the sociologist make of this? Because we hear a lot about what sports organizations and media organizations think about it in the fields, the two, the two intersecting fields of media and sport, uh, one, one might say in a Bourgeoisian sense. But um, what, what questions, what social questions uh, are important here? It's not just about, um, uh, the uh, leisure, you know, some kind of manufactured or commercialized leisure, um, but it's also who, who in particular um, suffers here. And um, the, it's not just, of course, a lot of people make their money uh, out of uh, professional sport, uh, and there's a big gap in the TV schedules, and therefore in the economy of, of media sport. Uh, but I felt that sociologists also had to talk about, well, what, what claim does sport make to its role, its socio-cultural role, um, and who is winning and losing in the pandemic? There's, a, there's been an almost complete focus on elite professional sport and the, uh, the, and the highest end of professional sport, mostly male team sport. Uh, and this happened at a time, the pandemic broke at a time that where women uh, were making serious inroads into the historically male dominated uh, institution of sport. But a whole series of other areas where sport uh, was disadvantaged uh, at the community level, at the school level, uh, disability sport, you know, those, those forms of sport 
that aren't the most glamorous, that don't uh, generate the most money and get the most media coverage. Uh, but I felt that sport um, needed to be uh, subjected to the status as a sociological analysis to say, well, what does it actually mean to the population? Who does it favor uh, above others? And, um, and what, what can a sociological analysis do um, to, to, to um, alleviate problems and indeed improve the situation after the pandemic? Thanks, David. So as you, as you just mentioned, you argue in your article that uh, we're in danger of losing the progress that has been made in equity and diversity in sports. Can you explain how sociology might respond in a little more detail? Yeah, because a, socio a sociologist wants to look at the whole institution, the whole field and its relationship um, to the wider society rather than just focus um, internally um, on, on the demands of organizations um, and individuals or agents, social agents involved um, uh, in, in a professional sense. And it seemed to me that sociologists um, are well attuned to the fact that sport was already unequal, an unequal field. Um, a, a field in which uh, enormous resources go to a very small number of people and organizations um, and, and much less uh, by, by way of resourcing goes, in, goes to, um, to others at the, well, one might for example say the grassroots level. Or as I mentioned in the case of women's sport were uh, been making some inroads uh, in, into male sport. And the, um, the danger, it seems to me, is that um, re in trying to reconstruct and protect sport uh, from the pandemic, what was being protected? It seemed to me that overwhelmingly it was the top end was being protected. Now, what a sociologist wants to know is, okay, well, sport is already unequal. The pandemic is making it even more unequal because, for example, women from say making inroads into sport are instantly identified as the most dispensable uh, or disposable part of the sport field by major sport and media organizations. So a sociological critique demands when, when something like normal service is restored after the pandemic, then, um, then what will the sport field look like then? And, and who, um, uh, can maintain whatever momentum that they had, or we can commence uh, the, the movement into get, getting greater equity in what is effectively a very hierarchical and in, inequitable institution. Thank you, David. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, I'll now call on uh, Robert Van Creeken to present uh, on his work. Oh, gosh, okay. I <laughs> thought I'd come a bit later. Um, thanks, Steve, and thanks, uh, Steve and Kate, for the invitation to contribute to this issue. Um, my piece isn't actually quite finished yet, um, so, but I'm nearly there, and hopefully this discussion will help kind of finalise what I want to say about it. Um, my work's always been influenced um, quite strongly by the work of the German sociologist Norbert Elias and his theory of the civilizing process and I thought it would be useful to see what kind of questions his overall approach might kind of lead to and I came up with three different things um, different ways in which we might step back from the immediacy of what's going on at the moment to come up with um, a way of thinking about things that 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 actually has um, has some kind of depth and the capacity to kind of inform what we do going into the future as well. There were three things um, that I'll try and fit into the five minutes. The first is to get a historical sense of what's going on, right? To see what's going on now as part of a long-term historical process. And there's now an enormous literature about um, the role that infectious disease has played in human life. Um, going back to the fall of the Roman Empire, right? Um, I mean, so we, have, we don't have to restrict ourselves to the Spanish flu or even the 
gib, uh, gib, gib, gibonic plague in um, in the 1300s, um, it's actually been an ongoing part of the way in which um, human beings relate to their natural environment and to each other. So microorganisms have played a crucial role in human history for a long time. And one of the key works here is William McNeil's Plagues and Peoples. I don't know um, how well known that book is, but it ought to be very well known in relation to this topic, right? Because he, he makes the point that um, the germs and disease has been as important an element in human history, especially in imperialism and, and colonialism, as, as gunpowder has or any kind of force of arms. He starts off with um, the Spanish in, 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 in South America and then has lots of other examples as well. So the, there's a real point to trying to um, have a sense of the historical dimensions of what we're it's experiencing now and trying to learn from, um, from the way in which that interrelationship between humans and microorganisms has worked in the past and what kind of long-term process we're part of at the moment. The second thing I wanted to say was that it is useful to think of how we might use the term civilization or civilizing processes to analyze what's going on because one of the elements of all that those kind of historical discussions is to point to the way in which is precisely the way in which we try to improve our lives and increase prosperity um, and so on and so forth all the things that we identify as civilization living in cities and you know um, and living um, in increasingly kind of wealthy kind of conglomerations of, of people has provided exactly the kind of conditions that enable infectious disease to emerge and to spread and so on. All the things that we regard as positive, like the ability to travel and, and you know, tourism, um, all those kind of aspects of social life that we place a high value on are also the things that um, allow those, um, those kind of diseases to emerge and spread. And part of it is, of course, um, a, a constantly changing relationship with our environment, changing relations between humans and animals, um, and that, that all kind of create the conditions for things like the, the COVID-19 um, outbreak. Um, part of what I want to try and say is that then that whatever we regard as, as, as a, a, a kind of domestication or civilization of the world, around us needs itself to be thought about reflexively. Right? So I talk about, uh, I try and explore the idea of a, of a meta-civilizing process, right? that we actually have to civilize the civilizing process itself. The third thing I wanted to say was that part of that um, involves a certain kind of psychological, emotional dimension as well, that a lot of what we're talking about here involves what kind of persons we are. Um, um, how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about our relations with other people. And you can see this really clearly in the disputes that are going on around masks at the moment, right? The response that people have, uh, the kind of reaction people have against the wearing of masks or any kind of constraint on their sociability has a real kind of visceral element to it. You can see it in, in the way in which the protesters are, are, are kind of throwing themselves into um, that kind of, with a certain kind of vehemence um, to resist the kind of constraints that are being imposed on them. Um, so that there's a whole, a whole kind of issue about, about human habitus, about you know, personality structures and so on that needs to be part of this debate as well. That it is about what kind of people we are, um, what it means to be a human being, what, what it means to be, um, to, to be regarded as valuable and interesting and engaging to all the people around you, that's a really important um, dimension of all of this as well. So they're the three things that I wanted to talk about in the piece and I'm nearly finished with it. Oh, thank you, Robert. Um, I did have a question and, and I wanted to ask you uh, um, related to points you just made. Uh, the extent to which we might think of COVID-19 as a civilizational effect? Um, it absolutely is. I mean, and that, that's in fact what, what, what anyone who's looked at it in the past will say, that, that, that infectious disease is always a kind of accompaniment to whatever we regard 
a civilization uh, um, 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 in terms of you know the emergence of agriculture urban urban life a certain kind of relationship between the country and the city and so on and then the question is become becomes then how do we civilize that right? in, in a way that enables us to control pandemics more effectively Thank you very much robert uh i'm now going to call on simon and seriana to present thank you thanks uh steve um i think um the with the sort of starting point for, for our article is, is perhaps um, the fact that, that this pandemic can be joined to a, to a whole string of uh, pandemics that arrive with European uh, colonization. Um, and and that what joins them is that they exacerbate and intensify uh, existing uh, colonial inequality and injustice. At the, at the time of writing, perhaps as a public health crisis, it looked as if infection uh, rates would be pretty low in Aotearoa, but we were we were concerned about the economic downturn that was likely likely to follow, and uh, the historical precedents of that, um, the end of the boom in the 1970s, the financial crisis, that Maori and uh, Pacific peoples are, are first to be fired and and last to be to be rehired, and and um, we noted that. Uh, that often uh, quite fragmented experiences of this inequality in times of, of crisis allow us to, to glimpse the kind of um, more totalizing sort of underlying structure of, of domination. And, and as part of that, we, we decided to look at the university where we have a, a particular familiarity and a, and a particular uh, interest that is giving a, a kind of insight that was available to us into the operation of the, the whole yeah, so, so for us, universities are sold to our communities as that option to um, be successful in today's world. So go to university and you'll be able to experience everything that the neoliberal world and um, capital world has to offer you. But when we look at the discipline of sociology, which sort of we see ourselves as the best at embracing um, you know, we're, we're the social justice discipline. We're the ones who are out there doing the fight, making things happen. But when you look quite closely, actually we've got a problem, particularly in sociology in Aotearoa. It's a mainly, we're producing Pakia sociology. We're not producing sociology that's reflective of our place in the world. So when we look at who's teaching um, across the country, less than 5% um, of Māori academic, uh, academics are Māori and less than 2% are Pacific. Within sociology itself, when we looked across um, permanent positions for Māori and Pacific sociologists, what we think it was one, yeah. <laughs> one, <laughs> one or two, one um, which, is not, which is not fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at what we're teaching, it's not, we're not teaching courses that are grounded in Te Ao Māori or grounded in Pacific. And when we are teaching courses that are grounded in Te Ao Māori, they're being staffed by people like Simon who are on temporary contracts. So what we're saying is we're happy to teach Māori and Pacific knowledge um, as long as it's like one course here or it's being taught by somebody temporary and are we happy as a discipline that Māori and Pacific will continue to do the necessary work of deconstructing our discipline and rebuilding it back up with Indigenous knowledges as long as it's on a temporary contract and I don't think that we can stand by ourselves as a discipline of sociology and say we're okay with that and the other thing we looked at is who are we teaching well, we've doubled our numbers of Māori and Pacific undergraduates in this country, but we haven't seen the same with postgraduate. So what we're saying, what we, we've got a broken pipeline, and COVID-19 is going to exasperate these issues um, even further. The first thing our universities did was announce budget cuts with the lack of international students. This means that our Māori and Pacific PTFs will not have contracts next year. This means our Māori and Pacific graduate students heard news that they didn't have a job the following week. How can we ethically recruit people into our discipline to do graduate studies when we are really aware that their career prospects and the ability to earn income during study is not there. Um, and the economic strain means we're losing our students. Māori and Pacific students are having to go to work to support their families. This means we're losing our current students and possibly future students. And these are sort of the challenges that Simon and I wanted to raise in relation to how does COVID-19 impact us as a discipline um, and how does it sort of continue a pattern of exclusion? Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, perhaps uh, just kind of add that, that uh, you know, we, we kind of finish on the, on the note that for, for uh, sociology to 
uh, remain kind of uh, vital and, and useful. And, and I think we think of it as a, as a kind of ground up sort of um, thinking and research and, a, and an indigenous kind of sense. I think that, that ground up really has to begin um, from, the, from the place of our thinking so that our so sociology is fundamentally informed and um, kind of invigorated by, by the, the, you know, the places and contexts and peoples of its, of its sort of uh, being practiced. Um, so it's it's kind of um, it's it's an urgent kind of question I think for for the future of the the discipline. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. And uh, and I wanted to really join points Robert made with with ones you both made, Simon and Seriana. Um, you know, Robert alluded to the point that infectious diseases have killed more people than wars, and arguably the second most important force there is behind colonialism. Uh, and I wanted, if, if you could please, to maybe say a little bit more about the ways in which you see the connections between colonialism and COVID-19. Um, there's a, a, a recent um, paper in the New Zealand uh, Medical Journal that looks at um, infection uh, fatality rates and, and projects that, that for uh, Māori these are likely to be 50% uh, um, greater. Um, and, and we know this isn't um, a kind of question of, of uh, genetic disposition or anything. We've seen similar statistics come out of the UK with Black, uh, Asian and uh, minority ethnic populations. Um, same as in the, the US with, with uh, Black people. Um, so there's something else kind of going along here and that, that something else is, is the kind of uh, existing um, inequalities um, in terms of health, racism and, and uh, health systems and, and structurally generally um, that, that produces a, a much higher kind of um, rate of death for, for Māori, uh, for Pacific um, uh, population. So I think there's quite a clear kind of connection there. I think as well um, to, to what perhaps Dave was saying about these kind of fair weather sort of progressive gains that in times of a crisis are shown that they, they were quite fleeting and that the, the, the move will be to protect the kind of hard, hard kernel of, of the, the privileged kind of people at the center of that. And I guess finally I just sort of say that, that if we think of, of colonialism not just as the domination of people but um, a, a kind of domination of, of the planet by, by capital then we see the kind of um, the, the industrial like uh, agriculture implementation of that, the kind of hyper exploitation of, of for a brevity's sake called cool nature. And that this is right down in the, in the kind of roots of the origins of these, these pandemics as well. So I think, um, I think that they're certainly kind of um, entangled at their, their very kind of origins together. Thank you very much. Um, we'll get a chance to ask you a few more things later, I hope. And for now, we'll hand back to Kate. Thanks, Steve. I've now asked uh, Lynn, Lynn Craig, would you mind uh, giving us a summary of your article? Uh, yeah, my paper looks at the implications of the coronavirus on domestic labour and care. Um, it certainly is a social crisis, and in some extent, it was a caregiving crisis. It opened the possibility that work and family, work and family and gender relations would be tested and disrupted. Um, not least because we're used to work and family being spatially separated, and um, also the labour is very differently categorised. With the um, activities of housework and raising children and providing family care are not um, not in very many places defined as work, even though they're laborious and time consuming. They have very different gender expectations and norms around them with men being associated with the um, breadwinner role historically and women um, with you know, being responsible for family care. Um, women increasingly entered employment, as we know, um, and men have started doing more housework and care over time, but nothing like the, um, the sea change that was in women's paid work. And so with most women now in the paid workforce, there's been a much more major change in that domain of gender relationships, the gender relations than in the, um, the household. This reflects the um, current, current approach to gender equality, which um, under neoliberalism really um, offers formal opportunity in education and employment, but frames the labor of social reproduction as a private matter for individuals and families to manage this has uh, not really been a workable solution to 
um, a major um, social problem for women um, and it's increasingly obviously problematic in a crisis like um, COVID um, because social reproduction is actually essential to underpin the economy and um, of course for the whole of society to function. So it's um, not just a private matter um, or even a matter between men and women in households, it's a social issue that's shaped by government policies and workplace practices, um, among other things. Um, early on, um, in, it looked like the government might um, see this, have seen this, because, um, for example, when they quickly made childcare free um, in the early weeks of the pandemic, it was um, largely because they could see that if mothers didn't have someone to look after their children, they'd have to do it themselves, and that many were needed in frontline work. Um, disproportionately care work itself. So this is all tied up with the paid, paid care economy as well. Um, and it, it raised the possibility there could be more collective um, responsibility or acknowledgement of it ongoing. Um, and so that was the public sphere side of things. But um, at the same time, with many thousands losing their jobs and being stand down, um, working at home obviously spiked and everyone was at home together at the same time in the same place. Um, with, with care and work over, overlaying on top of itself um, for multiple people at a time. Um, this also opened the possibility that there could be um, divisions of domestic labour and childcare changes. Um, uh, so it was kind of a, um, wasn't really known. Um, so we fielded, a, um, together with Brendan Churchill, um, I fielded a survey in, the, in May in 2020 during the first lockdown. And asked people how the pandemic had affected their time um, in domestic work and care and in paid work and in their subjective feelings about the balance of paid and unpaid work and how they were sharing it with their, um, their partners and um, others in the household. So um, uh, unsurprisingly, um, we found that time in unpaid work was much higher during the lockdown um, and it added substantially to um, reproductive labour overall. A lot of this reproductive labour re returned to the household, in, in fact. Um, men's time went up by more than two and a half hours a day and women's by more than three and a half hours a day. And there were some signs of gender narrowing in the gaps. Um, everyone was doing more, but um, men particularly were doing um, proportionally more care. And so relative gender differences were narrowed a bit. Um, not the same um, it happened for housework and household management, which um, went up for both um, men and women, but retained the same relative gender gap. Um, and of course, this additional domestic labour and care was on top of paid work and homeschooling was an extra requirement for those with school aged children. And it was um, extremely time consuming and stressful for um, everybody. Um, so we did find also narrowing gender gaps and dissatisfaction um, because um, mainly because men became a lot more dissatisfied under these circumstances. Um, quite um, sort of unexpectedly in a way, um, before COVID-19, um, more than 50% of the women uh, reported that before COVID-19, they, they were already extremely dissatisfied with how they shared their housework and unpaid care with their partner, um, at, compared with only 13% of men who felt the same before the pandemic. Um, but afterwards, that increased to 25% of men. So. Um, we got more gender similarity in, in overwork and, um, and in dissatisfaction. Um, but it really did show a, a very strong pre-existing problem and that really it was um, not improved by having men available in the home um, uh, in, at the same time. And we had open, got some open-ended responses to, to um, questions and um, the mentions of, you know, what is it, 1950? Um, you know, I feel like I'm a housework, how did I manage to end up, you know, with three degrees and married to a caveman? Those sort of comments were really quite um, uh, prevalent in the perspective of the people who were dissatisfied. Um, so I don't think it really uh, was a solution for households and um, largely that's because they were doing so much at the same time. So we were also, um, well, it wasn't something we um, could ask about, but obviously following the, the um, changes in, in, in the public sphere, to see how whether the pandemic would engender more ongoing recognition of the um, constraints on women um, and families and how it's best to support um, gender equal um, participation. Um, evidence is um, pretty mixed, um, mixed to bad. 
um, childcare uh, was one of the first things that was um, reverted to being paid for by parents very quickly, except in Victoria. Um, so um, the, the, there was no, no um, window there on um, getting uh, and more subsidies from um, collective subsidies to make, make that possible. But I'm interested at the moment in the way the aged care crisis is um, playing out. It too shows um, the systemic costs of um, poor care, and um, and the government and, and with a care with a care workforce that's um, largely uh, casual, um, low paid, um, undervalued for the actual importance and skill level required. Um, it again. There was there was government intervention that is currently in, in Victoria. Um, they, there's, there's been subsidies to care homes to retain workers. Um, nurses were um, supplied to aged care services at, at um, um, public expense, and there's been allowances instituted for women uh, for families to take their elders out of care to care at home. So um, it, it clearly reveals that um, the the paid and unpaid care um, economies are intertwined and that um, the government will be involved in making sure it, um, it works if they have to, um, although reverting back um, uh, in normal times is, 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 is probably the, uh, the most likely outcome. So uh, I would say that what we concluded really was, um, and it's an, still ongoing, so um, obviously we're all living through this in real time, but um, it still does seem that without making care a social issue, um, little will change post-pandemic. Um, so in, in terms of gender divisions of labour, without um, direct policy attention and support to both paid and unpaid care, I think we're likely to see um, wider rather than narrower um, gender disparity. Thank you so much, Lynn. I do have a question for you, but I've, I've noticed that we uh, have an audience member who has a question for you, so we might go to that instead. Mm -hmm. um, a question from Susan Gannon, she asks, what about single parents? Did you have any responses from sole parent households? We did have responses from sole parent households um, and they were under a, a, a great deal of, of, of stress and pressure. What we also noticed, and we haven't had a chance to really delve into it yet, is how much um, people who were living on their own with children um, mentioned their own their own parents, and so that the issue of um, grandparents. Also, we got responses from grandparents, so we were there was a there was an interesting um, indication that the uh, pandemic stopped what would have been um, useful. So, you know, out of household support. So grandparents co um, commenting that they couldn't, you know, they, they used to be regularly caring for their um, grandchildren and helping out. It um, seemed to be mostly in single parent households that we were noticing that the flip side of that, which was that um, people were saying that they, they used to be able to count on their mum um, and they weren't able to under these circumstances. So, um, yes, uh, I mean, the bulk of our respondents were... Um, uh, partnered, but they, there was definitely a, an enormous issue for, social, for single parent households. Yeah, thanks. And it sounds like it's really exacerbated the care deficit that we've seen. Thank you. We might turn now to Raywin. Steve. Raywin, it's great to have you join us. Good. Um, sorry about uh, arriving late. Uh, there was indeed a technical hitch. I hope you're hearing me now. Yes, yeah, Good. we can. Thank you. Good. Um, yeah, well, uh, I, I guess we all agree that this is not just a biomedical event, but a, a social disaster as well. Um, the, the economic impact um, is most severe on poor and stigmatised groups. Um, around the world in different ways. Um, even though the virus is probably largely spread by the rich through international travel and so forth. Um, but it's, you know, it's had a severe impact on groups, for instance, it's like if you look at India, on uh, migrant workers, a real disaster there. 
uh, it's producing stigmatization and uh, of Indian Muslims who are marginalized in a, a Hindu nationalist government and so forth. Um, there are obvious uh, social preconditions for, for, for what's happened, which we're all pretty familiar with. Weakened public services, more precarious labor forces, uh, ideological attacks on science that discredit um, medical advice and so forth. Also the, the sheer incompetence and callousness of contemporary states and political leaderships that we've seen. I mean, I hardly have to mention Trump. Um, Modi is deeply into blame games. Um, so are others. And we shouldn't forget our, our uh, Australian government either. Uh, which produced a magnificent fisc financial blunder in the, the, uh, in the estimates around, in the planning around JobKeeper, although that seems to have gone off the, the, the screen uh, completely uh, more recently, but uh, add in the aged care uh, sector uh, as well. So, you know, there are so many social dimensions <laughs> of this, uh, this, this mega event, uh, sociology uh, and other social sciences have to be relevant. Um, and yet it, it, it really strikes me that sociology is not at the table uh, when uh, policy is being, being worked out uh, in, in almost any part of the world. And it's worth thinking about why um, one reason, obviously, is that the harsher uh, right-wing ideology that is, is now predominant, uh, a turn towards kind of uh, managerial prerogative in the way political policy is, is made. We've just seen a spectacular example of that in the university policy put together by the, uh, the, the Australian government just now with virtually no consultation, let alone expertise. But also, I mean, one has to wonder if the condition of sociology itself uh, is, is one of the problems, uh, whether our existing uh, tools and frameworks, whether the, the, the global distribution of authority and resources in global sociology uh, is part of a problem. But one way or another, I really don't think that uh, we're, we're going to develop sociological responses to the, to the pandemic by, by practicing sociology as we know it. Um, we don't need more of the same. We are going to have to take account of the historical difference of the situation, the fact that we're dealing with, with mass terror uh, widespread death, uh, a new, really a, a, a new historical conjuncture, which brings, um, you know, biological processes and, uh, and social weaknesses together in, in very striking ways. Not, uh, as we've, uh, Robert has mentioned, for the first time in history, uh, but, you know, for the first time in this way. So if we're going to have an adequate sociologist adequate to this, uh, sociology has to change. It has to become, uh, you know, I I intellectually and, and culturally able to deal with the, with the sheer cruelty of the uh, present regimes. Uh, it has to deal with the, the massive uh, downstream consequences of, of coloniality, of, of enormous concentrations of wealth and growing economic gaps. It has to deal with the incredible failure of human solidarity that's involved in, in the, um, you know, the encouragement of, of racism, religious hatred and, and stigmatization. And of course, it has to get much more centrally connected to our relationship to the non-human environment from which this has actually arisen. But we need to do that also uh, by taking care of sociology because sociology itself is in a sense under threat ideologically uh, where right-wing regimes are now eliminationist about areas of knowledge they don't like 
so there are places in the world where, for instance, gender studies is just being shut down by governments. Um, and that can happen uh, to sociology more generally as well, if it, uh, when it becomes uh, convenient to do that. Um, we also have to think of what's been happening to the sociological workforce. Uh, we need to, uh, to respond to the, the, the casualization, even the outsourcing of sociology to, uh, you know, um, um, out of the, the, the public sector and the public university uh, to private research agencies and, uh, you know, uh, corporate organisations that are not even really research organisations, but are still uh, seen as the source of, of, of public policy. So we need to think of, of about uh, sociology intellectually and organisationally and in terms of the workforce. And we also think about who the audience is. And this, I think, is, is where I, you know, wind up actually in thinking at least at present in thinking about sociology in the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the virus's population growth strategy, uh, if I can anthropomorphize to that extent, and I know a virus is right on the borderline between the living and the non-living, but anyway, imagine it like that. The virus's strategy actually depends on human social interaction. That's how the population of the virus grows through our interactions. Um, and therefore we need to think of other ways to do interaction. We need to think of uh, and support other community responses to an event like this. And we know that that actually has worked in previous cases. That has worked when gay communities, for instance, invented the safe sex strategy that was one of the crucial things in slowing and then stopping the HIV AIDS pandemic. Uh, or Ebola even uh, in Africa at present, local communities have worked out the epidemiology for themselves and devised ways of living, ways of interacting that would stop the spread of the virus. So it's possible to do, whether, I mean, not easy to do for something that, that is spreading on a global scale and as fast as this one spreads. But it is what forms of social living, that, that I mean, it's our specialty in a way. We should know lots about this and we should be able to help communities in developing new forms of social life, including domestic life, gender relations in domestic life, economic life and so forth, that are embodied, that embed and literally embody uh, adequate responses to, to the pandemic. Um, so that I, mean, that I think is the most creative thing we can do in the short term, uh, is, is actually work on concrete utopias, if you like, uh, assisting communities to develop them. And of course, you know, applying our knowledge in that kind of way. Great, thank you so much, Roy. I really appreciate that. Um, and I had a question which relates to a point you made in your paper about the HIV AIDS epidemic being accompanied by um, an epidemic of signification. And that sort of put me in mind of uh, the World Health Organization's warnings around the infodemic that's accompanying COVID-19 and all the fake news and conspiracies that are circulating on social media. And I wonder what you thought the proper role for the social scientist uh, was to play in all of this. Yeah. Well, our, our media specialists, of course, will have a lot to say about how those stories themselves uh, arise and become popularised, get spread. Some of it very deliberate, obviously. Some of it uh, presumably uh, through enthusiasms of one kind or another. Um, and that's, you know, that's not a an area that I, I can say much about, though David might be able to, to, to fill us out there. Um, but I'm also interested in, in why uh, conspiracy theories and the, the, the craziest stories uh, actually are received, uh, are apparently believed or at any rate um, responded to as if they're believed. And I think they're, I mean, 
we have to think about uh, the, the, the free floating anxiety, if you like, that is out there on a massive scale before the epidemic ever arrived, and which is visible in the rise of authoritarian populist movements, um, in the electoral success of border protection strategies, which are deeply irrational, um, in the encouragement of racism and the reception of that encouragement. Um, so there's, a, again, a social background to this um, that, that we can, we, we do know something about um, and how we get our ideas out into popular, into wider circulation is a big issue because it's no good writing this kind of story um, in professional journals and expecting that to have a wider impact. It, it does need other forms of action uh, from sociology, I think. Thank you, Raymond. We did have a question from Cynthia fernandez Roach, and I'm hoping she's still with us. And this is addressed to Seriana. Uh, so Seriana, there was a question here saying, I would like to ask if there's been any specific strategy to retain casual Māori and Pacific Island academic staff uh, teaching at sociology at Auckland University specifically. Okay. Um. In our, in our paper, we kind of say, how do you use your own power and privilege to secure permanent full-time positions for Māori and Pacific academics? So, I mean, I don't, I know that there's a lot of rhetoric in our space about how can we ensure fantastic teachers and researchers like Simon can stay in our space, but really we have to start questioning when do we move beyond the rhetoric and what can we do? So things like creating opportunities for Simon to... Oh talking about you like you're not here. <laughs> How do we create opportunities for our amazing Māori and Pacific scholars to showcase what they're capable of? But also every single meeting you have with anyone who has power, put your hand up and say, what are we doing? Literally say to them, these are the numbers, what are we doing? These are the numbers, what are we doing? Because that's the only way we're gonna have, they have to be held to account. And it means going to those really annoying meetings where they spend 55 minutes talking about nothing and then give you five minutes of question time. Um, but that's what we need to do because otherwise they're just going to sweep it under the carpet um, and hope that it goes away. Our universities are really good at ignoring the critique because in that way they don't have to do anything. And disciplines are the same. They ignore the critique and hope that it goes away. And unfortunately, um, the Māori and Pacific research space, we're small enough that it's pretty hard to get rid of us because we remember. And we remember who was who stood by us and we remembered who who ignored us. Excellent. Thanks, Sarian. I'll hand back to you, Kate. Thanks, Steve. I'm uh, conscious that we were getting a little short on time. Uh, but I, I think it's really I suppose we always want to finish these panel events on a positive note. <laughs> I'm going to do the same. I think it's, it's fantastic to think about strategies for change. And as Raywin put it, concrete utopia. <laughs> we have seen out of this pandemic some amazing altruistic acts. And we have seen ways of being that are alternate to uh, how we were living prior to the pandemic and some policy changes that we also thought were beyond grasp. As Lynn said, um, childcare being, being freely available was something that we thought was off the table and then it, it something that we then nonetheless found possible uh, as a response to the pandemic. So I, I think, you know, moving forward, uh, we, our panelists have talked about um, new ways of thinking, new forms of action, new methods that we might use in order to interrogate uh, this crisis and, and provide alternate futures. And I, I think that these are all positives that as a sociological community, we really need to hold on to. David, do you have one final comment? Let's get on there. Um. Yeah, just for, well, one quick one, just about, about sociology in particular and its mission and connecting with what Raymond and others have said. Um, I'm just thinking of um, the sociologist of journalism, um, Michael Schutzen, and uh, he has a book uh, in which he talks about the need 
up for an unlovable press uh, in, in the media. The media should be unlovable, he says, which is that, you know, all the things that, that irritate people about, about the news media, the, you know, that they're, they're, they're nitpicking, they're critical, they're negative, etc. cetera. Um, sociology, I think, so, you know, falls into that kind of area at times that we're regarded as, un, as unlovable because um, we, uh, we look at institutions, processes, structures, and so on, and our impulses are you know, kind of built into sociology as a, um, as a critical practice is, is to emphasize you know, these issues of the creation and reproduction of inequality uh, and so on. And uh, I, I still think we have to make a case for an, for an unlovable sociology that we, it, it, a little like the news media, we have to say things that people often don't, don't want to hear and not be loved for it. Thank you, David. That's a wonderful note to end on, I think. The possibilities of an unlovable sociology. Thank you very much to all our panellists. I really appreciate you giving up your time today. It's um, wonderful to have such a large, large audience as well for the beginning of social science this week. And uh, thank you again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, thanks everyone, bye. Bye. Thank you.